All right, well, good afternoon, or it's not quite afternoon, but good morning to you, and hopefully you're having a good Tuesday. Um, and I see that some people are already put into the chat, and so one thing is I would like you for you to do is, as um, we start this class period is put into the chat one word or phrase to describe Adolf Hitler and Nazi Germany. So take a moment to please uh, think about that and if you can uh, kind of summarize um, Nazi Germany and Hitler into, into one word or phrase. So I see a few people put some stuff in. I know there's a lot more on the Google Meet. Uh, so take a moment here. Please uh, do that. That'd be fantastic. So I see controlling, threatening, deceptive, terrifying. And yet, you know, uh, those are all good words. And I know there's some more out there. And if you're thinking that someone just used your word, that's okay. Plop that in the chat. Um, would be fantastic. Okay. Oh, we got four. I know there's a lot more. Uh, and so <clears throat> as you're thinking about that, that word, um, went back, looked at the Google form, uh, the forms that people had filled out and appreciate that. And, uh, looked at how we rated Hitler in terms of the scale one to 10 on the totalitarian scale. Adding it all together, it uh, looks like we have put uh, Hitler uh, as a 7.89 on the scale. So I would think if, he, if you put him in the 7, 8, 9, 10 category, that's putting him in there as um, high up there as a totalitarian. And historians would definitely agree with uh, those conclusions. And there are a number of reasons you know, that, that go into that, that high score. So Hitler, I guess if we look at it, has set the standard here. And so now when we go and look at Joseph Stalin, does Hitler or does Stalin um, meet uh, the, the kind of the totalitarian standard that, that Hitler has established? Or um, does he take it to another level? And um, if you're in, in uh, 3.1, we'll take a look at Mao. And so then we can also look at that point too. So it would be nice if a few more individuals would put some uh, points into, uh, into the chat about uh, that one word to describe Hitler and, and Nazi Germany. Okay. So um, as we get ready to, to move on, uh, to uh, Joseph Stalin, just want to remind you that there is still time to turn things in. Uh, missing summative or formative assessments, and especially if it's if it's missing uh, summative, that that's a that's a game changer. You definitely want to get that taken care of and turn that in, please. Okay. Uh, so yes, life changing illusions of success. Ooh, that's. That's a good one there. Illusion of success. Uh, you can you can definitely see that there's a lot of smoke and mirrors there uh, with uh, Nazi Germany. Um, and you could you could even uh, perhaps throw in there that uh, uh, chaotic or um, contradictions, or you can use uh, the the color gray. Uh, when it comes to understanding what Adolf Hitler is trying to try to get at, uh, get done and getting his subordinates to follow through on that. So again, thank you for those who have put some words in there. I appreciate that. So um, I want us to focus on, on Joseph Stalin and uh, contemporary of Adolf Hitler, uh, but also uh, 
take a look here at this moment here. Adolf Hitler, he emerges as a leader in an authoritarian state, or he, Hitler uh, is in control of an emerging authoritarian state. That would be a better way to phrase it. Where Joseph Stalin, uh, he emerges as a leader, but the authoritarian state is already established. And it was established under his predecessor, uh, Vladimir Lenin. And so uh, part of today is I want to look at how uh, the authoritarian state in the Soviet Union is established and then uh, <clears throat> allude to um, and, and focus on uh, how Stalin uh, begins to kind of emerge. Uh, and so that's part of it. But then uh, to kind of kickstart that, I have a video clip here that kind of gets us stimulated in terms of thinking about um, who the guy is, all right? And so let me get my uh, video clip ready here. All right, so I will mute myself so we can hear this a little bit better. In terms of ruthlessness, uh, bloodlust, Stalin remains one of the greatest villains of the 20th century. Yosef Jukashvili was born on December 18, 1879. He later changed his name to Stalin, meaning man of steel. Stalin had a very harsh childhood in terms of poverty, and he had a tough life as a young man and was very quickly attracted to radical movements and causes. Between 1902 and 1913, Stalin was imprisoned eight times by the Russian secret police. Stalin's rise to power started after the Russian Revolution of 1917 when the Bolsheviks deposed the Tsar and created a communist society. Lenin died in 1924, and there was a big struggle about the succession of Lenin. Stalin eventually took over in a very complex maneuver that really showed his master skills as a manipulator of men. Under Stalin, Russia became the second largest uh, industrial economy in the world. It was all planned economies, five-year plans, and if you didn't play by his rules, you went off to a labor camp, and, or you were summarily executed in, in some fashion. Three million kulaks died as a result of Stalin's policies in the early 1930s. Now, he did increase the amount of food that was being produced, but at what cost? During what many historians term Stalin's reign of terror, no one was safe from his ambition. His forced industrialization led to countless millions of deaths and the worst man-made famine in human history. Just before World War II, Hitler and Stalin signed a non-aggression pact. That fell apart uh, in June of 1941 when Hitler invaded the Soviet Union. When the Germans turned and began to invade Russia, they underestimated Joe Stalin. The siege of Stalingrad was so great, there was no food on either side. So the German soldiers would give little children who were residents of Stalingrad a crust of bread if they would fill their canteens from the Bobo River. And as the children came back into Stalingrad, they were shot by Stalin snipers. That's how he consolidated his power. The most uh, feared man in Russia and with very good reason. The Soviet Union lost an estimated 20 million people during World War II, more than any other nation. During the Big Three conferences, Stalin demanded much of Eastern Europe as compensation. Stalin established an iron curtain from the Baltic to the Adriatic Sea. The Soviet Union was a major superpower with the potential of a nuclear arsenal in 1949. So that meant he had brought the Soviet Union from a minor regional power in Europe to a global superpower. On March 5th, 
1953, Joseph Stalin died. Stalin is regarded by many Russian citizens as a great man. They had enormous pride in what he did for their country. Uh, he raised it to a level that it had not been before. He was mostly feared. He gave us the KGB. He gave us the Soviet labor camps. He gave us summary executions. We don't know how many people died at his hand in his own country for both reasons that were real and imagined, because they did not play by Stalin's rules. I think Stalin's image today is increasingly concentrated around his role as one of the greatest mass murderers of the 20th century. All right. Um, does anyone have any like immediate takeaways just from that little video clip uh, about Joseph Stalin? You know, we use this clip as kind of like our little intro to as we study Joseph Stalin over the next several several days. Anyone have any thoughts about him uh, at this moment? Uh, feel free to unmute or put into the <clears throat> into the chat. I think one thing, you know, we as as uh, historians uh, and I view us all as historians is that we, we look at individuals like Stalin and Hitler and uh, take a look at the the totalness of uh, these individuals and uh, think of the snapshots that um, that exist about him. Or about those individuals but take a look at everything that they have done if we just focus on one aspect we're not really fully evaluating um, the totalness of it and uh, so yeah that's a very good point about um, what shapes you as individuals and so that's where we talk about that context you know what how can we put these things into context uh, so much of individuals like Stalin, in this case, or even we can look at Mao and Hitler, Fidel Castro, and look at um, what is influencing them to act the way they are. Um, you know, we always uh, sometimes would uh, kid about uh, Walt Disney movies and uh, the tragedy that is associated with um, the mom's. In, in those movies, well, if we were going to look at um, creating movies on authoritarians or cartoons on authoritarians, uh, it has there has to be some part that dealt with uh, their upbringing and the difficulties that they may have had with um, their fathers. And so Hitler and Stalin and Mao uh, had a very difficult relationship with uh, their fathers, uh, their father, and um, that will influence them as well. So um, any other thoughts or questions about uh, Stalin? You know, feel free to unmute or share in the chat. Okay. Um, so as we go through, again, always feel free to share your comments and concerns. Uh, I do want to share with you for a moment here Stalin's rise to power. And so we're looking at... Uh, 1924 to 1929. And so those are the years that um, <clears throat> speak to, to, to uh, the power struggle after Lenin's death. However, we can look at to his rise to power. We can go all the way back to even uh, 1917 or, or earlier. But if we go to 1917 and 1929, that's, that's including uh, the revolution years. I do have a copy of these notes in Schoology. You can go to the presentation folder. Um, I think in, that I have in week six. So you can take a look at that and you can download them, follow along as uh, and add your own thoughts to it as well. Um, I'll try to uh, be terse and to the point here. I've only had a couple slides, but I can get into it. So I got to keep myself a little disciplined here. 
So when we look at the, the, the one party state in the Soviet Union here, um, there we go. It really is created under Vladimir Lenin. So he's the father of the Soviet Union. He is the face of communism and he will pave the way for uh, leaders like <clears throat> Joseph Stalin. And so we know that Russia was engaged in a it was engaged in the First World War and the First World War is going to destabilize Russia to a point where uh, it gets to, to a crisis state, and so revolution does happen. And there are actually, in 1917, will be two revolutions that will occur. One in February of 1917, that's where uh, provisional government is created. It's, it's, it's um, left of center leaning, um, but not to the extreme that, uh, like the Bolsheviks, and the Bolsheviks are the ones that will take power in October of 1917 in that October Revolution. And the Bolsheviks, they're going to claim that their success uh, gave them the absolute right to govern Russia. Uh, and they felt that they had uh, represented the will of the Russian uh, proletariat. And proletariat is just another way of saying um, worker. So you'll sometimes hear me throw out words proletariat. And it just really means worker. Now, <clears throat> between 1917 and 1922, uh, there will be the Bolshevik co uh, consolidation of power. And really, that's Lenin consolidating his power. Uh, Russia is going to break down into a civil war. You're going to have uh, the Bolsheviks that are sometimes uh, referred to as the Reds will go up against uh, the Whites, which are sometimes uh, referring to... Um, supporters of of uh the deposed czar nicholas ii and um foreign uh interventionists as well uh however the bolsheviks are going to win the civil war and so now they can start reshaping uh society now what are some of those elements going to be and how is that going to look you know ultimately an authoritarian state is going to emerge here now, the key to Lenin's control is an idea of democratic centralism, all right? So this is in some ways beginning to kind of put um, a framework together of what communism is going to look like. So we got democratic centralism. And so by 1922, the Soviet Union becomes a one-party state led by Lenin. And he felt that true democracy lies in party members' obedience to the authority and the instructions of the leaders, all right, in this case, Vladimir Lenin and the Politburo. That's going to be an important group as well. It's a small group, a vanguard of communist leaders. So really, that's democratic centralism. Democracy lies in party members' obedience to the authority and um, instructions of the leaders. So not necessarily about the people of the country, but of the party. So that's why we sometimes say that this is a dictatorship of the proletariat. And the proletariat are led by Bolshevik leaders who think they know best. Okay. Now, between 1917 and 1924, Lenin establishes authority. What does that uh, um authoritarian rule. What does that look like? Well, I've got the, the elements of it there. And so quickly, the CPSU, which is the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, uh, and Soviet just means council. So there's another wor uh, nice word out there with the definition. Soviet means word, proletariat means worker. Um, Soviet, excuse me, means council. <clears throat> uh, so you have your one party that is allowed to exist. The Cheka uh, is very similar to like the Gestapo. Uh, this is a secret police and the secret police are going to impose the will of Lenin and the Communist Party. Factionalism is banned, so no opposition is allowed. 
uh, no opposing political parties, but no factions within uh, uh, the Communist Party. So that's another thing, another aspect of democratic centralism. Purges and showcase trials will go on, uh, removing uh, opposing socialists and um, capitalists, uh, any clergy, anyone who is uh, problematic or a threat to the one party state is gonna get removed. Nationalization, uh, which is going to occur. So uh, private companies will be taken over by the government uh, because centralized planning is going to begin here. And part of that centralized planning is going to be embodied in uh, the economic policy known as the new economic policy or simply NEP. And this is going to be the way that Lenin and the <clears throat> communists are going to try to move the Soviet Union from a rather uh, agrarian dominated uh, economy to a more industrial based economy. And so NEP is <clears throat> going to be kind of like a hybrid of um, socialism, uh, government planning, and uh, try to accelerate the process towards industrialization. Of course, the cultural revolution is going to go on. Uh, you have to begin to re-engineer how people think and act and, and they want to shape uh, society into a communist world and create a whole new kind of uh, image. And then showcase that and export that brand out into the world. And that's where the Coming Turn come into play here. Coming Turn is an international organization to uh, spark worldwide revolution. This is something that Lenin really believed in. This is something that Trotsky is going to really believe in. Stalin is not 100% on, on board with that. Okay. So we have the authoritarian rule being established under Lenin, but then he dies in 1924. And as in the video clip, it had mentioned uh, a power struggle um, begins. All right. Just before we get to that uh, power struggle and Stalin emerging as the leading contender. Uh, to kind of give you an idea what the Soviet government structure looked like in 1924, or the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics government structure in 1924 looked like. Not that you really need to know the the the, the components of it, but the the most important body within this government structure is the Central Committee. And the, those on the Central Committee are really um, the, uh, the party loyalists, uh, the key leaders. Uh, if you get appointed to the Central Committee, uh, you must be someone within the party. And so Stalin and Trotsky and Lenin, all of them will be, Karin, uh, they'll be part of this committee. And from this committee, all ideas really flow and leadership flows to it. Yeah, you're going to have a general secretary, Stalin, by 19, you know, he emerges and he'll be that general secretary. Uh, and that's kind of like the head of the government for all practical purposes, the de facto, de facto leader of the, of, of the USSR. But realistically, what they do uh, will come from the central committee and then goes from there. So this is the important piece here. But if you can find yourself having an influence in this area, in that area, in this area uh, with the party Congress, uh, you can you can wield some power. And Joseph Stalin is going to find his influence in many of these bodies. So Joseph Stalin will emerge uh, as a leading contender here. And there are some reasons why he's able to do that. Now, to give some context, which um, if we look at uh, what is he doing that is going to put himself at least in that position to be considered a leading contender. Well, you have to go back to what kind of role did he have in the 1917 revolutions? If you want to be a leader in the Soviet Union, you got to connect yourself to that revolution. And Joseph Stalin's going to be able to do that. However, um, he's not 
a, he does not play a, a active role in the revolution. I, I want to make that clear. He does return to uh, Petrograd in 1917. You know, the video kind of alluded to that as well. He had um, found his way out of prison. He seems to know how to do that. And when he comes uh, to uh, Petrograd or St. Petersburg, he is a member of the Communist Party. Uh, he had joined it earlier. And he joins um, on the, the, the party newspaper staff. He's the editor of the party newspaper staff. And that is known as Pravda, the truth. He's elected to the Central Committee of the party, which, remember, is a very important organization. And But he didn't take a leading role in planning the October Revolution. He left that to Lenin and to Trotsky. And um, that kind of will be thrown at him uh, between uh, 1917 and 1924. And then as he tries to emerge as lead contender, as they keep coming back to, or they reference it, um, about his role in the revolution. Now, looking at his positions, uh, he, as you can see, he's going to find himself in a number of uh, positions within the organization of the party and of the of the government. When it says people commissar for nationalities, that just means uh, he's in charge of uh, the officials that are in the various regions. Uh, in the Soviet Union, which is about 15 different uh, republics or, or regions that make up uh, the Soviet Union, Russia being uh, the biggest one there. He's the liaison officer between the Polar Bureau and the Org Bureau, which basically means he gets to monitor party uh, policy and personnel. So he's uh, that's a pretty significant role there. Head of the Workers and Peasants Inspector, uh, basically, he uh, gets to uh, oversee uh, workers of all government departments. He's the general secretary of the Communist uh, Party. Very important as well, because uh, that is uh, ultimately kind of, like I said, the de facto leader of the Soviet Union. And... Uh, <clears throat> Also, he, as a result of all these different positions, it's going to give him power patronage, which basically means he gets to appoint people to different positions. And he's going to do that in all these different levels. So when, when the time comes, uh, he can just uh, remind them that I need your support and you got to give it to me because your position is a result of what Stalin had done. So uh, he is working behind the scenes here. He's going to be outmaneuvering some of his opponents. So that's important. Keep that in your mind. Lenin just died in 1924, but there is not a successor that really is anointed to, to take over. And so a power struggle does begin. And we see that uh, where that was mentioned in the video. Now, before Lenin dies, he did write something known as a testament, which is kind of like your final thoughts. Um, it's like a will. Um, this could be your, 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 your looking back on um, the events that have happened. Well, in Lenin's testament, he does look back on uh, the Communist Party and who makes up uh, the leadership of the Communist Party, and he does throw some shade on some individuals. Uh, he does not speak highly of Leon Trotsky, and that's a name that you uh, need to kind of remember. Uh, Leon Trotsky is extremely intelligent. He is uh, philosophically, in many ways, um, head way ahead of the game on Joseph Stalin when it comes to uh, communism. He's the architect of the Red Army, but he's also a little um, spacey, and he doesn't pay attention to details that will come back to hurt him. So Lenin doesn't speak too highly of him, but he also doesn't speak highly of Joseph Stalin in that testament. 
uh, to a point where he looks at Joseph Stalin as probably the biggest threat. Now, you see, I put the word in there, suppression of Lenin's testament, which basically means it's not going to be um, known to the Communist Party, the greater Communist Party, uh, until much later down the road, 1956, so after Stalin has died. Now, there are some speculate that the reason the Testament wasn't uh, published and known because uh, they did not want to uh, perhaps hurt uh, Stalin and Trotsky and other uh, communist leaders who uh, might be affected by this testament. And they also didn't want to uh, create factionalism. So they kept uh, Lenin testament unknown until 1956 during the de-Stalinization period of the Soviet Union under Khrushchev. So um, by 1929, uh, Stalin is going to be able to emerge from a power struggle. Now, that power struggle that develops, that's something that you will look at uh, with the focus questions. Okay? So, does anyone have any questions related to what I just said about um, Joseph Stalin here and how he rises to power? Feel free to unmute or put into the chat. I do want you to look at um, Schoology here, and I did open this up earlier, and so you have your focus questions, and they're going to be due tomorrow. And these focus questions are, are going to be related to the methods of how he uh, is able to, the methods that he uses in order to emerge as the leader by 1929. So the first couple of questions are kind of like a review of what I said um, in, in my notes, and you'll find that in, in the book in chapter two. Trotsky is an important threat to uh, Stalin, and so Trotsky needs to get eliminated, and ultimately he will by 1940. He is going to be assassinated. It's amazing. Many of the leaders, key leaders of the Russian Revolution in 1917, um, by 1940 have been eliminated. And you could probably point the finger towards uh, Stalin on that one. And then questions four and five uh, represent how he goes after some of his opposition. And then six and seven in some ways can speak to methods and um, how he uses popular opinion to his advantage as well. So all this speaks to is his methods that allows him to uh, really solidify his position as the leader by 1929. And once he does that, then he can re-engineer uh, Soviet Union in his, uh, in his image or how, what kind of plans he has for the Soviet Union. Okay, and again, this is due um, tomorrow. So do we have any questions? All right. So, um, so we're at this point where uh, I'm done with what I needed to do. Uh, you can stay on the Google Meet, ask me some questions about this or about grades. Um, if not, if you don't have any questions or concerns, uh, you can exit and leave and have a fantastic day. Work on those focus questions.